you know, you, you uh, come back and you're maybe going to have a few choice comments about things. And I thought, well, you know, Dave's on crutches, so I won't go after him. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I should have rethought that. Um, I, uh, it's great to be here. And, uh, you know, whenever I'm, whenever I'm here, which isn't nearly often enough, I always kind of realize that um, one of the things that, that I think needs fixing, at least from my perspective, is there's really no sort of communication or, or uh, interaction in some ways between uh, the folks at Davis and the folks at, uh, at Berkeley and the MPZ. And it's, that's something I'd really like to, like to try to fix um, because there should be a lot. There should be a lot more. Well, today what I thought I'd do is talk to you about a uh, sort of one thread, one, one theme that goes through a lot of work in my lab. Um, and it's on sort of different aspects of population biology and conservation biology of a species, the California tiger salamander. And I thought I'd talk about this rather than uh, phylogenetics of turtles or, or comparative phylogeography or a bunch of other things that we do in my group, um, in part because I feel like this is a, it's a very MVZ-centric kind of, kind of an approach. It's, it's uh, foundations are based in natural history. Um, it takes a very kind of long-term approach to studying uh, population biology, both from the ecological and the evolutionary, microevolutionary side of things, and has a strong conservation uh, side to it. And but before I get into that, um, what I was thinking about, you know, the old days in the MVZ, and it's been over 30 years now since I was an undergrad here. Uh, and thinking about sort of life lessons that I, that I might have learned, um, there, there were kind of three of them that, that really struck me that I thought I'd just mention for a second. The first is something I learned here and I've continued to this day, and that is that sort of endlessly and sometimes mindlessly driving around in circles, catching animals and doing something with them actually can be the foundation of a pretty interesting research program. I didn't know that was possible until I came to the MPZ and among other people um, <clears throat> The second is that uh, I think well-informed, interesting, and, and sort of uh, uh, just good quality um, biology and sort of passionate uh, conservation biology can, and in fact, I think should go hand in hand in any research program. And, um, uh oh, sorry, that's not the one I wanted. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, press uh, enter. You do it for me. Okay, there we go. And then I want to. That's forward. Once, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and anyhow, the, the um, no, that's, that's the wrong way. Oh, that's the last line. Oh, that's sorry. That's the last line. Okay, we've got to do it again. So once again, how did you start it? So, uh, it's a new system. New system. Okay. So it's down. Okay. Anyhow. Um, and to my mind, there's, I mean, I've yet to meet a person who better sort of put together the notion that you can do strong science and do important conservation work uh, than Bob Stebbins, who here was my teacher in the first herpetology class I ever took back in 1976. And Bob sort of stands out as a real kind of hero in my mind uh, for that kind of an approach and pioneering that kind of an approach. And the third thing that I learned at Berkeley, uh, again in the context of actually this same course, is that you should always be very, very careful about who you take your shirt off in front of um, because you never know who's going to be watching. And so for any of you who ever wondered what uh, our own TJ Pappenfuss <laughs> thought of himself a long time ago, in my opinion, the body language says it all. <laughs> There you go, and there's Bob with a two-day growth down in the Mojave. Okay, um, what I want to talk to you about today is the California <coughs> tiger salamander, what I refer to as the tiger of Merle Jules. Um, it's a species that is sort of a key player in a research program in my lab 
working on ambistomatic salamanders and the tiger salamander complex in particular um, that goes back to the beginnings of my PhD work, continues in a very, very active way to this day. Um, and what I thought I'd do is, is just sort of tell you about a number of different um, sort of elements of the research that we're doing on this species. As I said, that I hope simultaneously address sort of some interesting population biology and some important conservation work in the species. So let's start where you know everything starts, um, which is a little bit of natural history. Probably most of the people in this room understand what it means to be an amphibian with a biphasic life cycle. Remember, most amphibians, um, and at least at the level of deep diversity, most salamanders have a biphasic life cycle. Uh, that means they have an aquatic larval phase and a terrestrial phase, and both are important. Um, so, assuming we can go forward on that, um, just to kind of get you sort of dialed in here to what we're talking about, um, California tiger salamanders live and, and breed in the Central Valley and the Intercoast Range, and at least traditionally they, um, they utilize these big vernal pools, big sort of plyovernal pools as well as smaller pools. Um, this is a big one <coughs> down in Fresno County. Um, and the basic, oh, this is uh, another pool at Hastings. Um, this is our official one uh, called Blomquist Pond that has a drift fence around it that uh, Pete Trenum and I and Walt Koenig ran for many years before we got thrown off of that, uh, that ranch. Um, anyhow, the, uh, the sort of basic biology of the animals is that um, they spend most of their lives underground in, in Hastings, in ground squirrel burrows, in other places in gopher burrows. Um, when the rains come and the pools fill, they migrate down to the pools, they court, they mate, females lay their eggs. Here's a couple of eggs with some embryos developing inside of them. Female clutch size is about a thousand. She lays her eggs individually or in little pairs like this. Those eggs uh, develop into aquatic larvae which are completely aquatic animals. They, uh, everything about how they feed, how they locomote, is all aquatic. And they are the top predators, oftentimes, um, in these from pool systems um, they, that they live in. They spend, two, they spend maybe three months in the pool. They metamorphose. They come out. They turn into a terrestrial tiger salamander. And then they go on land. And from now on, they return to the pools to breed. But they are fundamentally terrestrial animals. So there's a little bit of natural history. So what are some of the things that at least we'd like to understand, at least I'd like to understand, in both thinking about the basic biology of the system and also thinking about conservation? Well, you certainly have to understand something about phylogenetic diversity, um, whether it's at deep or shallow levels. In this case, it's going to be mostly at sort of within species levels. Um, you know, you kind of got to know who the players are if you want to think about how they evolved or if you want to think about how to protect them. And that's, at some level, all about phylogenetics and population genetics. Um, I would like to know something about how they use their habitat, and in particular, how they use the terrestrial habitat, because it's really hard to get at. And so we've got some, some sort of nice, old-fashioned direct measures, as well as some other indirect genetic measures that I'll talk to you about. And then in the case of the tiger salamander system, um, there's a really interesting sort of problem with hybridization that makes you think about, uh, I mean, it's a fascinating problem in terms of sort of speciation biology. Um, it's also a fascinating problem in terms of management and how you think about hybrids when you're dealing with an endangered species. And I should say that the California tiger salamander, in case you don't know, is federally listed under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. That listing has been a sort of protracted one that's spanned from 2001 to 2004, but it's now fully protected over its range. Okay, so first of all, a little bit on phylogenetics. Um, for those of us who have been around for a while, uh, there was a time when California tiger salamander, Ambistoma californiense, was considered to be a subspecies of Ambistoma tigritum, the wide-ranging tiger salamander from across the United States. Um, <clears throat> but both from a sort of phylogenetic perspective as well as from a sort of character-based perspective, it's, it's quite clear that Ambistoma californiense at least qualifies as a perfectly good species. It's isolated. It's the, and in fact, from a phylogenetic perspective, it's the sister group to the other 14 species that are currently recognized 
in the tiger salamander complex. So it's not only distinct, but it's, it's very distinct. There's a lot of speciation events over on this side of the, of the tree. This is a mitochondrial tree, um, but nuclear genes that we have, as well as Al's, older alzheimer data, all support that contention that it's a perfectly good species. Um, within it, we can ask, you know, what can we say about sort of phylogeography? And if you're thinking as a basic biologist, you think about phylo sort of phylogeographic units. If you're thinking as a applied person, you tend to think about what are called distinct population segments, because those are the official terms that the U.S. Endangered Species Act uses for thinking about managing within species diversity, at least for vertebrates. Um, this shows you the range of the California tiger salamander. Um, these are, this is just a little dot map of um, every locality that's at least registered in the museum or that we have in our own collections uh, for the species. <coughs> and so there, um, you know, we all know where San Francisco is, but some people don't. A few key things to kind of think about. One is that most of these localities are sprinkled through the Central Valley or the you know, coast range. There are two isolated bits to it. One up here in Sonoma County, which is, at least in terms of localities, is quite isolated from the rest of the range. One down here in Santa Barbara County, in the north part of Santa Barbara County, um, that's also quite isolated. And these introduced things um, we'll, we'll talk about a bit later. So <clears throat> if you just sort of do what comes naturally, uh, what many people in this room do on a regular basis, a few years ago, we went out and collected about 700 individuals from uh, 85 populations and built a, a tree based on some mitochondrial DNA and sort of took a gander at that and um, published that work a few years ago in molecular ecology. And what we found based on that tree is that there were um, several different sort of quite distinct uh, sort of phylogeographic units that fell out. Um, probably the most important in many respects are the fact that Santa Barbara and Sonoma are both on long branches, both are very, very well supported, both seem to be phylogenetically very distinct and also very differentiated from the rest, as well as being geographically isolated. There are also a couple of other um, sort of well-defined clades based on the mitochondrial DNA, and then a few in here that are a little bit sloppier. Um, if you sort of map those out on a, uh, on a landscape and you try to sort of think about differentiation within and among those <coughs> by doing a set of sort of nested um, amovas based on at least the mitochondrial DNA, um, this is the kind of story that, that falls out. So these two very strongly differentiated clades in Sonoma and Santa Barbara counties, and then a series of, of other replacing units within from a management perspective, what's now called the central distinct population segment uh, of the species. And they, they make some sense. Um, things like the San Andreas Fault separates these two. Um, this one, it's a little harder to figure out quite what separates them. There's a big ecological barrier here. So at least there are other, other uh, kind of landscape features that line up with these mitochondrial units. Um, we, of course, wanted to test that with some nuclear data, and um, we have done that, although we haven't uh, we've done it at some level, although not in a completely satisfying one. So what we did is we, we went in and took that, um, sampled about 30 individuals from across the range and across those clades, those mitochondrial clades, um, and picked up uh, 10 unlinked nuclear genes, so about 7,000 base pairs of data and sort of took a look at what that had to say. And for this work, what we really wanted to do is just focus on those Sonoma and Santa Barbara um, subunits because they're, they're quite important from both a management perspective and, and because they're just sort of isolated geographically. And when we did that, this just kind of gives you a sense of what some of those data look like. Um, it's a little confusing knowing quite what to do with them. What I've done here is just shown five of those 10 gene trees um, and this work is not published yet, um, and have just sort of highlighted the sequences from Santa Barbara County and from Sonoma County so you can get a sense of uh, sort of what they look like. And what you can see is that there's no support values on these trees um, for good reasons because they'd be really crappy, but 
Um, what you can see is that in a lot of the gene trees, Santa Barbara um, does fall out as a monophyletic unit. Um, and if you sort of think back to, you know, Hudson and Coyne and sort of the time to monophyly of an average uh, nuclear gene compared to a mitochondrial gene, the fact that um, such a large fraction of the map is monophyletic is very, very strong evidence that Santa Barbara really is a good unit. And um, we're in the process of probably describing Santa Barbara as a distinct species um, based on these data and on its, its uh, very strong geographical isolation. Sonoma, not so much. You know, Sonoma's kind of sprinkled all over the place, and it's a little hard to see um, the, uh, a strong signal of Sonoma coming out as a, as a <coughs> separate thing. One of the one piece of analysis that we've done um, with this, or, and we're, we're doing others, is just again to take those that that data, think about it as um, rather than a sequence level, think of it as just alleles do a series of, of sort of nested AMOVAs and ask um, where do we see sort of strong signals of, of structure in a kind of FST framework. And um, what, what comes out of that is that you get sort of three units um, based on the, on the nuclear data. One in Santa Barbara, which is very distinct, as you might expect from looking at the gene trees. And then what you see is this very interesting pattern of a sort of west side of the Central Valley um, unit and east side of the Central Valley mm -hmm. unit with very strong FSTs um, between those and not a whole lot of structure, at least that we can pick out within them. Um, there's this sort of east and west side of the, of the valley makes some sense, especially if the old river systems, the San Joaquin and, and uh, Sacramento rivers um, were in fact historical barriers to gene flow, and it's something we're kind of moving forward on. Um, so just to sort of summarize this part of the, of the work, um, depending on if you sort of listen to the, to the mitochondrial data or listen to the nuclear data, it certainly suggests that there's somewhere between three and six different um, <coughs> sort of genetic units that we might want to think about uh, within this species. Certainly looks to me, at least, like there's an example of cryptic speciation with those Santa Barbara animals. Um, those have management implications. And in fact, based on these results, um, just for those of you who like to think about taking your work um, and making it truly management relevant, um, the, what the US Fish and Wildlife Service did with these data is they said, OK, well, we'll sort of take a position where it looks like Sonoma and Santa Barbara counties are, are distinct entities. So they listed both of those as endangered. They listed the rest as a single entity as threatened. The point is, is that the service, if you care to work with those folks, really will take these kinds of data and really use them to sort of uh, come up with management plans, which for me, at least, is a very satisfying element. What are we doing next? Um, there's something sort of very unsatisfying about just using that sort of handful of, of nuclear gene data. One of the great advantages that we have in working with the Tiger Salamander system is that uh, Randall Voss at the University of Kentucky um, has a big salamander genome project that he's been marching along on for quite a while. And uh, Randall has a, you know, even by model system standards, I think a reasonable set of genomic resources that are now available. He's got a couple thousand ESTs that are that are all mapped out in the axolotl, which is very closely related to the tiger salamander. And so, uh, what we've been doing with Randall under a sort of grant that we have right now together is um, we've developed um, a plate of SNPs, and uh, so it's so it's 96 genetically independent SNPs that are sprinkled about every 1% of the genome across the genome. And what we're planning on doing is a big analysis where we get 100 populations, 10 individuals per population for those 96 SNPs, run them all, sort of genotype everybody, run it through structure, run it through structural lava, and, um, and just sort of see what that SNP data tells us about management units. Okay. Um, 
let's leave that. That gives us some sense, at least, of genetic variation within the species and what we might want to think about in terms of different units that might need separate management or might need at least separate consideration. And kind of look to the second part of, of this story, which is terrestrial habitat use. As I said, um, I mean, it's really interesting. Everybody refers to things like tiger salamanders or spadefoots or um, uh, well, certainly those two taxa as being sort of vernal pool endemics. And, you know, true enough, you know, the animals need a vernal pool or a cow pond or something to breed in. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you actually count up the amount of time that a tiger salamander spends in the water, um, I've sort of done these calculations, and depending on how tidy a person you are, um, they spend roughly as much time in the water as you spend in a shower in your life, um, <coughs> assuming you take a sort of reasonable length shower. So the fact is, is that we don't consider ourselves aquatic based on the time we spend in the shower, and they're, they're not aquatic animals. They're terrestrial animals. They spend virtually all their life on land. And yet, up until quite recently, we've known almost nothing about where they are in a landscape and how they utilize those terrestrial landscapes. And I would argue that is true of virtually every pond breeding amphibian in the West, and it's true of just about every pond breeding amphibian in the world. Um, you know, you think about you think about uh, Sudacris regillum, the commonest frog around here. You think about Tarika. You think about any number of pond breeding amphibians. And what we know is, is that they come in, they breed, and they go away. And next year, they come back. And that's what we know. And so it's hard to manage that. And so we wanted to learn more about it with the hydrocellular system. And here's what I'd really like to know. If you think about it as the world as a rural pool or a pond and terrestrial habitat around it, what I'd really like to know is not just kind of how far a few individuals move, but I'd really like to know where are, you know, where is 90% of the population? Remember, they're all underground. They're all out of sight, out of mind. Um, where are they? Is 95% of the population within 100 meters of the pool? Is it within 10 kilometers of the pool? Um, and you need to know those things, both if you just want to think about how they interact with landscapes and also think about managing them. Um, and then, what we did, this is work I've done collaboratively with both Pete Trenum and, and Chris Searson in my lab, um, is to sort of take this one step further and think not just about where is the population, where are the individuals, but sort of where is the, what's the density distribution of the reproductive values? I'll tell you that, how we think about that in just a moment. So how do we do this? Um, well, the landscape we've done it on originally was out at, uh, at, at Hastings in Monterey County. Uh, the last half dozen years or so, it's been primarily out of Jepson Prairie. Jepson is in Solano County, about, oh, I don't know, 45 minutes from here probably, um, to the east. Just, uh, and it's, um, it's one of the last and most intact vernal pool kind of habitats left on the floor of the Central Valley. Now, the sad part is, is that it's only 1,700 acres. Um, so it's a small parcel of land but it's very, very rich in, in sort of rural pools. And what do we do? We do uh, what amphibian biologists always do. We set up drift fences. That's a drift fence right there. And we put buckets in the ground and we catch salamanders. Um, and we let them tell us where they live. This is how, a, for any of you who haven't done this exercise, this is how a, a drift fence works. Um, you put up some sort of a fencing material, you dig it into the ground, you get up there with the ditch witch, and you dig a hole and you stick it in. And uh, when a salamander's up and about walking around at night, they, they come up on a rainy night, they crash into it, they want to go around it, they fall in the bucket, you know, they're sort of dim bulbs and they just they crash into the bucket. If it's on this side of the bucket, we know it was going this way. If it's on this side of the bucket, we know it was going this way. We go out every morning, we count them up, record who was where, take a picture of them so that we can do some digital image analysis of those animals, and then let them go. Um, the difference between this study and a lot of studies is that rather than just wanting to understand who comes into the breeding site and who goes out, we wanted to know where they are on the landscape. And so the way we did this, this was a design by Pete Trenum, <coughs> is every hundred meters going out to a kilometer, 
and we stopped at a kilometer because that's where you run out of land at Jensen Prairie. Um, what we did is we put in a 10 meter long fence with buckets on either end of it. Okay? And as you go out in this direction, um, <coughs> you get more and more and more fences because the, uh, you want to keep sort of, the way we did this is that it's a 10% it's a coverage, so at every line, there's a 10 meter fence, a 90 meter gap, a 10 meter fence, da, 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 da. and so as you go out, the wedge gets bigger and bigger, and you have more and more fences out there. We have it at two replicate sites. One is Old Cop Lake, which I believe is the largest remaining vernal pool in the Central Valley. It's, uh, it's about 40 or 35 hectares. It's an enormous vernal pool. And then a smaller one down here called Round Pond, which is about uh, two hectares. Total of 164 drift fences. When you walk these drift fence lines back and forth and back and forth, it's about a 14 kilometer walk. And we do that every morning after it rains. We've done that for the last five years. And what do we do? We catch animals and we figure wherever we caught them, that's a proxy of what they're doing on the terrestrial landscape. And, well, it didn't come out as well as it could have. But anyhow, um, this is uh, some of, this is the, the sort of gross summary of the recapture data. For the 0506 year, that year we had about 8,500 captures, and um, this is sort of where you, and the axes didn't come out on this. Oh, it's charming. Um, okay, I've got them over there, but not here. Um, so <clears throat> what do we have? Um, sorry, um, each one of these are you know 0, 100, 200, 300, 400, 5, 6, 7, 8, and a kilometer distances from the edge of the pond. Uh, yellow is metamorphs, juveniles do this, and adults kind of trail along like this. Um, and these are frequent, these are uh, capture frequencies, and it's uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 per fence, per 10 meter fence. So the fact is, is that we catch um, a lot of animals. We certainly catch an awful lot of metamorphs, a lot of these little new babies when they're just first coming out of the water. And there's a couple of things that, that come out of this. The first is that um, animals are, well, if, if you look at the juveniles, which are the sort of age one to five animals before they come back to breed for the first time, which probably give the most honest representation of their sort of overall normal distribution on the landscape. Um, they're concentrated near the edge of the pond, but you basically get a big plateau at 100, 200, and 300 meters out, and a pretty fat tail on that all the way up <coughs> to a kilometer. So the fact is, is that the sort of maximum density uh, distribution of at least juveniles is not right up against the pond. And perhaps the most interesting thing is that at least for juveniles and adults, there's a lot of animals a kilometer out, and they came from this pond. We know that. We have some enough marked animals that we can say that with certainty. So what we wanted to do with this is to not just sort of summarize. What we wanted to kind of do is, is sort of boil it all down into a single statistic that might tell us something about what? It might tell us something about the sort of biological value of land as you go from the pond edge out. Okay? So, so how important is that land to the salamanders? And so, what we can do is we can calculate for new metamorphs, which take five years to metamorphose, for juveniles, which are anywhere from one to four years old, and for adults, which are five to 11 years old. We can calculate their probability of survival. We have that information from work we did case studies. We can sort of multiply the probability of survival by the density distribution of animals in each one of these distances and come up with what we have as sort of a reproductive value, which is just the summed, um, the, 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 the summed value of the probability of survival times the density distribution of animals as a function of distance away from the pool. Okay? And it gives us sort of a sense of, of sort of how important these different areas are to the biology of the animals. And again, the axes didn't come through on this, but anyhow, this is what you come up with. Um, and what it says is that there's a sort of nice, sort of continuous with a very high R squared um, relationship between the, the reproductive value 
of, of land as a function of distance away from the pool. Okay, and so what it sort of says is, is that if you take the sum total of the animals um, that are near the pond edge across babies, juveniles, and adults, and multiply them out by their probability of survival, that the sort of total amount of reproductive value or potential um, at that distance is up here, and the total out here in a kilometer is down here. And we can use that, we used it uh, in a paper that's in press right now, to think about, um, sort of trying to think about mitigation, actually. It's a very applied concept today, but to try and think about the importance of losing acreage here as opposed to losing acreage here to the biology of the animals. It's kind of a different way of thinking about mitigation. But some interesting results that come out of this is that um, if you then take that curve and you integrate it um, as a sort of cone around the whole, the whole pond, what you come up with is that if you want to protect 95% of the reproductive value of that population at Jefferson Prairie, you have to go out to about two and a half kilometers to get 95% of that reproductive value. And that is an area that's right around 500 hectares, or something over 1,200 acres. So that's kind of how much you need if you want to protect 95% of the reproductive value of that population. Another way of looking at this is that a hectare at the pond edge is about 17 times as valuable as a hectare a kilometer out from the pool. And you can see then, you know, if you think about things like mitigation value, you can think about saying to a developer, so protection mitigation is expensive and, and, and difficult, but one of the things that we've been promoting with the Fish and Wildlife Service to think about with this kind of data is if you say to a developer, rather than saying you always have to do a two to one mitigation, of the species, if you say, well, if you're going to nuke an acre of habitat right at the pond edge, you're going to have to have a 20 to 1 mitigation ratio for that. But if you move out a kilometer, well, you know, then it's, it's down to, to only a 1 to 1. And if you'll move out a couple of kilometers, it's a half to 1. And what's, what's that doing? Well, first of all, it's kind of honestly assessing the biological value of the land. And the other thing it's doing is it's providing the one thing that actually might work in conservation, which is it's providing a financial incentive to people to do the right thing for the right reasons, or perhaps for the wrong reasons. But it's providing an incentive to them to say, stay away from the, from the choice, the, the most important areas. Um, we're kind of working with the service right now to see if they can, if they'll sort of buy into this. Uh, we'll see. But it's been sort of fun to think about. Um, one of the things that this brings up in my mind is another uh, bit that I'll tell you about just very briefly, which is in more complex landscapes, um, how do these animals, again, how do they view a landscape? How do they think about a landscape and how do they work on it? How do they sort of interact with that landscape? And to get at this, um, we just can't do it with brute force or can't do it very well at least. And so what we've done is, is gone to a sort of landscape genetics approach, and I'll uh, tell you about one study. There's several of them like this that are going on in the lab right now. This is work that Ian Wang is doing. Um, and it's at um, Old Fort Ord. I don't know how many people have been out there. It's in Monterey County. Um, sort of suffered the fate of, of a lot of uh, military lands and um, is being converted over from a military base to other uses. Fort Ord, in its northern part, even though it's very, it's very coastal, uh, has a wonderful collection of vernal pools um, that are in a very complex, interesting um, uh, mosaic of different habitat types. And so what we did is we kind of wanted to ask the question, how do salamanders move between those vernal pools? What's the kind of likelihood of crossing different habitat types? So what are the data? There's 15 ponds or pools up there. We looked at something over 600 individuals for 15 microsatellite loci and um, did a couple of different analyses. But where we want to go with this, if you're familiar with this stuff, is we wanted to do a least cost path analysis to try to understand how animals are moving between ponds across different landscapes. Um, and again, give us a sense of, of uh, how they interact with, with the landscape. We did that in two ways. I'll just go over this very briefly. Um, one is, is using um, this Bayesian analysis of population structure, BAPS. And then another is using uh, Bruce Ramallah's um, 
Bezos uh, strategy, which kind of looks at contemporary asymmetric gene flow between populations with an emphasis on contemporary. So what do we do? Um, the BAPS analysis, which is, is sort of gives you similar outputs to structure, simply look at to say, are these different ponds, are these different breeding sites genetically different enough that we can use an assignment probability approach to figure out if animals are moving between them or not? And the answer is kind of, yeah, each one of these is a different pond, and BAPS finds those ponds, at least a lot of them, um, you know, pretty easily and says that there is a, a fair bit of genetic structure among those different sites. Even though this is a landscape that only covers a total of three or four kilometers or five kilometers, it's a small landscape, but there's a lot of substructure among those parts. <coughs> and then the, uh, the Bezos results, which remember are looking at truly contemporary sort of assignment-based differences or, or um, analyses to ask whether in the last couple of generations there have been individuals who have moved from site A to site B or not that we can pick up genetically. It's a very stringent kind of an approach. Um, and with it, among all the different combinations of those 15 ponds, we found four pairs where we could measure kind of contemporary gene flow using this approach. And those are those four ponds. And then we use that data to come up with um, a least cost migration path. Um, so here's how it works. Um, here's again that, that same landscape, and we've now broken this up into the ponds or the blue dots into um, three different habitat types. Okay, so out there, there's a lot of oak woodland, which is all the purple. There's coastal chaparral, it's a soft chaparral, and that's the green. And then there's grassland, and that's the yellow. And I should emphasize, California tiger salamanders, all tiger salamanders, they are grassland species. They live on grasses, they're prairie species. Um, Everybody knows. I know. I've worked on these things for you know 30 years. I know this as well as anybody on the planet that they like grasslands and they like to cross grasslands. Okay, and we also know that chaparral is a hard, spiny, terrible kind of habitat, and salamanders are delicate little animals, and so they ought to hate chaparral. And oak woodland, you know, it's kind of a little hard to say. So, so what do we do? Well, we um, the the sort of strategy is to sort of iteratively fit, you know, use the genetic distance, the, the, the uh, genetic migration information that we got out of Bezos between these sets of ponds and use it to sort of with that as a fix and, and uh, uh, a, a known entity, then start iterating different costs associated with crossing a pixel of each of the different habitat types. And you can, you can do this, and it, it's an, an ARC um, program, and calculate the least cost paths um, between these different, uh, these different pairs where we have some information. Um, and then sort of you can just compare these predicted migration frequencies with measured ones and ask sort of where you get the best match between what you see in the genetics and costs and paths based on differential costs of crossing grassland, chaparral, and woodland. Okay. You can do that exercise, and when you do that exercise, um, what you come up with is something that, um, and I'm, I'm still not sure I really believe it, uh, but if it's true, it's to me completely surprising. Um, what you come up with is if a cost of one is the least cost, and a higher cost, everything is relative to that cost of one. What we learned from this analysis is that, in fact, the habitat type that those salamanders are most likely, that it sort of has the least cost, that is where we see the, uh, the greatest propensity to cross habitats, is in chaparral, the thing that I would have thought would have been terrible. And that basically the cost for crossing grassland is about two. Cost for chaparral is one, and cost of crossing oak woodland is about five. Now, the fact is, is that um, in many areas, you never find tiger salamanders, even though there's good habitat, even though there's good vernal pools, 
in dense oak woodland. You always find it in sort of areas that are cleared out. Um, and there are, in fact, some natural history observations that are consistent with this. But to me, it was a complete eye-opener. Um, and it just told me, once again, that even though I think I understand something about these animals, I probably don't. And that, in fact, you know, that Chaparral is the winner, assuming this is right. Um, so what does that do? Well, it tells you, it certainly says you sort of look at a landscape like this in a very different way. Um, it says that, you know, these patches of oak woodland are, assuming this is right, really, really sort of severe barriers to the animals. It also says, if you're thinking about, again, bringing it back to management, if you're thinking about management, so, in fact, on the table is going to be to put some roads across Fort Ord. And if you think about it, well, you know, if you were going to put a road from east to west across old Fort Ord, um, you might kind of say, based on this, that sort of stringing that road here across Oak Woodland might not be good for other things, might not be good for pocket iron salamanders, but for, um, from the point of view of this particular endangered species, well, they're not kind of crossing this anyhow, so maybe that wouldn't be a half bad place to put it. Whereas shifting it down a few hundred meters and putting it here, where you're spreading it all right through Chaparral, would be a bad place to put it. And those are kind of interesting observations that you can, you can sort of think about. Okay, um, the last thing I want to talk to you about, uh, something that's, that's uh, been occupying an awful lot of our time in the last few years, and this is work that I've done a lot of uh, in collaboration with Ben Fitzpatrick, now at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, is to think about hybridization. Um, some of you may know this, many of you may not, that um, there's a big issue with hybridization between native California tiger salamanders and introduced non-native salamanders. Um, it's a big conservation concern for the animals. It was one of the sort of nails in the coffin of listing the species in 2004. But it's also a huge opportunity for studying speciation in these guys. These are alpatric populations. I'll show you. So the story, in a nutshell, is that here's the range of the California tiger salamander. In the 1950s, a guy named Don Green and his buddies drove out to uh, North Texas, collected tens of thousands of salamanders, tiger salamanders of different species, uh, the barred tiger salamander and Mr. Matagrana portion, collected them, put them in their pickup truck, drove them out to California, and dumped them into ponds in central California. And they did tens of thousands of them. And I know this because I've talked to the guy. He still lives in Salinas. And I've, I've sat down and chatted with him about it. He's very proud of the work that he did. Now you might ask, why would someone drive to Texas, collect tens of thousands of a weird salamander, and dump them in California when we already have tiger salamanders? Oh, I'm sorry, these are just the two players, California tiger salamander and the barred tiger salamander. And you might ask sort of why did they do this? And the reason they did it is that in the 1930s, all the rivers in California were dammed as part of the sort of California Water Project. They created all these uh, reservoirs. Well, you've got all this water, you've got to do something with it. So what did they do? They dumped warm water fishes from the east, like largemouth bass, into those reservoirs. Well, then you've got to catch the fish. How do you catch the fish? Well, everyone in the east likes to use what are called water dogs. Water dogs are tiger salamander larvae. And it turns out that most tiger salamander larvae will get really big. They become these big pedomorphs, and that's true for the ones from Texas. But it turns out that California tiger salamanders never evolved the ability to do that. So we only have these little puny larvae, whereas the ones from Texas are really big. So therefore, you want to catch big bass, you need big water dogs. These guys were bait dealers. Away they went. So, what happened? Um, we, <clears throat> so, in this kind of whole region of the central coast, uh, coast range, um, those guys, the Don Green and his pals, were beavering away, dumping salamanders out into the Salinas Valley. So, in order for us to kind of study this, um, what we did is generated 10 species specific SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So, they're just you know, we've shown that they're, they're species specific for California NC and for abortion. And we've sort of scored those for all kinds of individuals across all kinds of uh, parts of the range of this, of this introduction. Um, and sort of the first thing we did was just to ask, when you find them together, how much hybridization is going on? 
And the answer is lots of migration, sort of in, in a variety of ponds that we've looked at. You see clear evidence of F2s, of back crosses, and of later generation hybrids. So you certainly, they certainly do hybridize, and they have been hybridizing for probably on the order of 20 generations out there. Um, and there's also some very interesting patterns of differential introgression, both by habitat and by genomic region. So by habitat, um, probably the most important single thing that's come out of this work is that if you do a kind of scan across, well, it's up to over 100 ponds now, but this slide is from 85 ponds, from across the range of the introduction, and you simply categorize those ponds into ones that are seasonal, that is, they always dry up, and ones that are perennial, that at least some years they hold water. What do you find? So down here is a non-native ancestry score. So down here is mostly non-native genes. Over here is mostly native genes. And what you find is that, um, is that in seasonal ponds, you get um, a, a, vast, a vast majority of animals in seasonal ponds are largely native. And where you see all of the sort of highly introgressed non-native populations popping up is in the perennial ponds down here. So all the high hybrid index scores are sort of concentrated in perennial ponds. And it's a very, very strong result. Um, we're trying to do some experimental work right now to figure out why those non-native genes do so much better in perennial ponds than in seasonal ponds, and we've got some kind of interesting observations on that. Um, so that's, a, that's kind of one result. Um, uh, right, okay, and then um, at a very different level, we just, Ben and I just published a paper last year that sort of looked at within pond selection on genotype, admi on, on uh, admixture dynamics. And so in this study, um, what we did is we just looked at five ponds, we had 10 SNPs, and what we did is a kind of a classic kind of cross-sectional design where we looked at eggs and we looked at larvae, and we asked um, what sort of combinations of genotypes are winning out during the course of one bout of within generational selection. And this is a kind of a figure that Ben Fitzpatrick put together from that, uh, from that paper. It's the sort of main figure, and we'll just walk you through it quickly. This is five different ponds, and the what we're showing here is it's a it's a funny graph. Along the x-axis in each panel is the ancestry score. So again, over here means you're very non-native, and over here means you're very native. And this is a pond level um, sort of sort of graph that's based on, on about 50 individuals per pond that we genotype for these 10 these 10 SNPs. So up here is heterozygosity. So that's what fraction of those genes you're heterozygote at. Along here is just the ancestry score. Okay? So, um, so you've got sort of two different ways of thinking about your admixture. One is individual locus heterozygosity. One is just the total amount to which you're non-native, native, or intermediate. Okay? And what happens is, and then this is in the egg stage, and this is in the larval stage. And what happened in this study is that in all five ponds, um, and, and the darkness, I'm sorry, is just a, it's just a density distribution of the, of the data. So dark means that's where most of the data lie. And what happened over and over again is that wherever it was that you started in the egg stage, you kind of moved up and to the left um, in the larval stage, meaning there was always selection for more intermediate admixture dynamics and for sort of uh, intermediate heterozygosity levels. Okay. And so this just sort of shows you that's where it started in the egg stage and it shifted up over here. And that was a significant, a significant result. And it doesn't matter if you start over here on the left-hand side, which is um, mostly native, you kind of shift up to the center. Or if you start over here in the lower right-hand side, you shift up towards the center. And what it <coughs> sort of suggests is that selection favors hybrid genotypes. Um, it selects it both at the level of just your overall admixture score 
and at the level of your heterozygosity. And in a nutshell, what that means is that if you're going to try to remove these non-native genes, it means you're kind of fighting an uphill battle because selection is really sort of favoring keeping the mixture in the middle. Okay. Um, just one other interesting result that uh, we're, this is just kind of hot off the press. We're taking this again to a slightly more genomic level. Um, we now have a panel of, uh, uh, this shows I think 85 markers evenly spaced across the genome. And um, this is sort of just an, an average for five different ponds, a different set of ponds. Um, and what we did is we just wanted to ask, um, um, in a sense, what we did is just ordered markers from um, their sort of value of deviation from the overall mean from, uh, from sort of low to high. And the only point of this graph, um, and we haven't really finished doing the analysis on this yet, is that what's real interesting about it is that, in my mind at least, is that out of these 85 markers, there's a small set of markers that always go to fixation for non-native alleles, even in a pond where the hybrid index score is virtually pure California tiger cell meter. So it's virtually pure native, but there's a few markers that just zoom to fixation for the non-native allele. Um, just a handful of them, but a few. And similarly, if there's a handful of markers that even in a very, very, very um, uh, non-native pond always stay native. So there are markers that just want to be native all the time. And critically, there are markers that want to be non-native. These are just wonderful alleles, apparently, that came in with the non-native species. And they zoom to fixation as soon as they get into a population. And again, if we want to think about any kind of remediation in getting rid of these non-native alleles, the previous slide suggested that on average, sort of admixed individuals do well. This analysis suggests that there's a few just totally kick-ass alleles that we're probably never going to get rid of. And probably they're going to sweep through the whole population, through the whole species. Okay, um, so conclusions. I don't know where I'm out of time. I'm feeling a bad feeling about it. Anyhow, um, <laughs> a few things. There are some very distinct phylogeographic and management units within the species. They have sadly, absurdly large terrestrial habitat requirements that make management very difficult, but that's an interesting species. There's some landscape genetics work that I talked about in terms of vegetation types and differential permeability. They're giving us new insights into how they use the landscape. Um, the studies of hybrids suggest that we're going to be stuck with these, that it's difficult is what we say in the management world, but we're going to be stuck with these non-native genes, and they're not going to go away. Um, there's all kinds of interesting future things we want to do with them. Um, one of them I was going to mention to you is a, is a quick uh, ecological niche modeling study. We just, just banged this out a couple of days ago. I'm not going to just skip this for a moment. Um, and uh, this is your computer screwed this up. But um, <laughs> anyhow, a whole bunch of folks um, who, have, who have worked very, very hard over the last six or eight years to help with all this work. Um, John Abrami and Greg Pauly on the systematic side, landscape ecology, Pete Trenum is an absolute leader in this world, Chris Searcy, and Levi Gray from my lab. Landscape genetics is mostly by Lily Wang. The hybridization work, Ben Fitzpatrick, who's now left, and Jared Johnson, who's the current postdoc in the lab, and Raymond Voss, and then lots of other folks. Thank you. Can we catch the lights back there, please? <laughs> um, yes, questions. Yeah. So, Brad, do you think you're under a, with the um, with the study on the Jepson range? Do you think that your sample is actually biased toward those uh, population, the, the drift fences that are closest to the pond, so that the the value of the more distant land is actually underestimated? Um, 